lesson number 25. So that sets up the book itself. Uh, number three, Israel will come to ruin. No doubt it is set. That's, that's not going to change. Now, people, the people of Israel still had that opportunity to repent, turn to God for individual salvation, but the nation was going to be destroyed. Verse 5, let us return to the Lord. And that's what that's what I was just talking about. Get individually, get right with God. And then number six, there is hope for Israel, but it's not in the nation as, as, it, as it was constituted then. Their hope was going to come uh, after the exile and a return with Judah. And after that, it would be uh, of the nation of Judah and under the house of David. Uh, so the kings and rulers that would come from the lineage of David. And especially when we come to the New Testament times, uh, the Christ who is son of David, a descendant of David. So. Getting into our lesson today, we're going to start with the exposition of the text. Hey, this is the good part of it. This is a fun part where we move right through it, okay? And uh, Hosea chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, excuse me, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And we talked a good bit about that last week, uh, uh, how that Jeroboam the second kind of ends, and we know that the, this account, what Hosea is talking about, goes on down to the northern uh, kingdom kings of uh, Zechariah, Shalom, uh, Menahem, Pekah, Pekahiah, uh, Pekahiah, Pekah, and I want to say Ahaziah, the last one. Might be wrong when we get to that. But we're going to look at that in a moment, though. Uh, go back to that, uh, that chart. And it's because Jeroboam II was the last one that the Lord had anointed. 
the other ones, they, they come by assassinating kings. <laughs> you know, it's, it's turmoil. And the book of Hosea talks about that. Um, so it gives you that perspective. And again, we also talked last week how that Hosea probably had quite a long period as a uh, speaking prophet, but this book sent, uh, focuses on one theme, one particular event, and that's the destruction of the, the nation, the northern kingdom. So he's been prophesying for quite a, a long time. If, if he's been there, uh, where did verse one go to? If he's been there since they you know, Isaiah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, even at that, you know, that's going to lead for a long time afterwards. But you know, he's been there for a good while already, prophesying. But the writing of it now is there. So you have this chronological setting that's given to us at the very first. So you get right in, boy, he goes right to it. Here's what the Lord tells him to do. All right? And in verse 2. And this, this analogy of Hosea's family goes through those first three chapters. Right? This is setting up the rest of the book. So Israel's adultery is symbolized by Hosea's unfaithful wife. So you deal with the wife first, verses 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, uh, how long ago was that? that? That may have been 20 years before whatever. Okay? But when he's first speaking, when the Lord first gives him a message, he's, the Lord's already setting this up, getting it prepared. The Lord said to Hosea, go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For what reason? For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So here's where Physical adultery is associated with spiritual adultery. You have that connection made to, to draw this picture, this analogy that's being made. Well, let me ask a question. So, understand that God is wanting him to do this so that the Israelites will see, understand why he has him marry an adulterous wife. To symbolize, symbolize, but it's to let make the Israelites realize here's what you're doing. I mean, I don't understand why he tells you to marry a okay. Indian wife. Uh, throughout the scriptures, there's all kinds of pictures that are are given. Word pictures, okay. But sometimes there are actual, shall we say, it's almost like a play that is given. Like in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel sometimes is told to go out and lay. Now, the, the scripture will say lay naked. Now, he's not totally naked, but he's laying there. He's probably just got a loincloth on. And lay there on the ground and build like sandcastle type thing around him. Here's Jerusalem, and here's this and that, and here's the army coming. A, a, you see what I'm saying, like a picture, uh, and playing it out, what he's saying. So here's a prophet that's doing the same thing, so that he can explain to people, this is how God is put. Look, you, here's my situation, and God told me to do this because he's saying, this is what's happening the Lord is telling me this is what's happening to him by Israel, by the nation. Does that yeah. help to make sense? And also test his faith to see if he'll be faithful to God in a simple situation, right? Yeah. God sometimes asks his prophets to do 
things that just don't make a whole lot of sense. And well, who can explain the life of Samson? <laughs> you know, some of the things that Samson did. Now he finally gets it right in the end, but boy, that's, it's like, how did God use Samson like that? Thank you. There you go. <coughs> okay. And, and it gives us, again, and I talked about this earlier uh, in earlier lessons. Now, is he saying, marry a prostitute? Or is he saying, marry a woman who worships down at the temple of Baal and Ashtoreth? In other versions, it says harlotry is prostitute. But is it the physical harlotry or the spiritual harlotry? Is this real? Now, now understand, it's going to become, in essence, real. But is she doing this because she is she is a prostitute? Or is it because she is of a different religion that allows religion. for not so much prostitution, but uh, worship? Well, but a part of their worship was uh, a lot of sexual conduct. Okay. And so her lovers, later on when talks to lovers, is that the men? Now, you, typically the men don't give a hoot about prostitutes that they're visiting, right? right? So who are her lovers? Well, are her lovers Baal <laughs> and some of these idol gods? Is that who's being referenced? My idol God, I go down here to Baal and I participate in these fertility cult rites and look, we're getting food on the table. Baal does that. We're getting uh, clothes and we're, look, we're, 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 we're enriched. But who was enriching? Who 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 really was prospering Israel at that time? Well, we know it was the Lord. Because the Lord had made them poor, had brought them famine, and all kinds of stuff, pestilence. All through they wouldn't repent. Okay, I'll make you rich, I'll, I'll give you prosperity, and I'm sending my prophets to tell you that I'm making you prosperous, but still they went down and they practiced these fertility rites at the fertility cult temples. What? Well, it's not the Lord, it's Baal. And you go down, you get down to the end uh, later in these in the book of uh, Hosea, and no longer will you say, my Baal, you'll say, my husband. The Lord is my husband, not my Baal. Okay, so kind of keep that. In. So I, I don't know if you can sort through that. See what I'm saying? So Go marry a woman who is a prostitute, or go marry a woman who is of this religion. Probably that leads to that. Uh -oh. You make your decision for yourself on that, okay? All right. Verse 3. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaine. And she conceived and bore him a son. Right? So, the son, verse 4. Okay? 
verse 4 and 5, talking about this, this son, this oldest son. The Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. And that's, I believe, how you would pronounce it. Okay, not Jezreel. Jezreel, the L meaning God. Okay, Jezreel. For in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Guaranteed, right? Sure thing. The house of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom is going to be destroyed. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel, all right? So, uh, call his name Jezreel, which means it has kind of a double meaning. God sows, or what do you do when you sow seed? Scattered. God scatters. What's he going to do with the house of Israel? or with the, the people of Israel, he's going to scatter them into exile, right? So, if you really want to get into what is happening here to make the connection, why call him Jezreel? Second Kings, chapter 9. Starting with the verse 14. Oops, second king chapter 9. Well, first of all, just go to, to verse 1. Starting out. Uh, is that, and in mine, on mine, the title up there, what this is about, Jehu anointed king of Israel. Remember we talked about Elijah? When Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel, but that should be the end of it, right? He went down, he, he slaughtered the prophets, those prophets beheaded them probably. That should have been the end of it, right? But <laughs> Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. And what does Elijah do? He runs. He says, the Lord says, what are you doing here in this cave? He's way down in, in, uh, Mount Mon in the Sinai Peninsula. What, what are you doing here? I'm the only one left. They've all they, they've all bowed the knee to you know they've they've all turned to the idol worship. Just bells at me. I'm the only one left. Well, the Lord says I have what nine thousand, five thousand, whatever uh, in Israel. It's not bowed the knee to the hall. But I got three things for you to do. Number one, you go back. You anoint the new king for Syria. You anoint a new king for Israel, which was Jehu, right? And then you anoint a prophet to take your place. And that prophet would be Elisha. Okay. So he goes back, he does that, and then what happens to Elijah? He gets taken to heaven in the whirlwind. Elisha takes over as the prophet. You have some things happening with him. Okay, verse 14. Thus Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. So what happens when, when Ahaz, the evil king, Ahab, I'm sorry, Ahab, the evil king, is killed, then Joram, his son, takes over. Well, wait a minute, Jehu was anointed king. Yeah, but he's got to finish off the house of Ahaz, so to speak. That's what he does. 
And if you go down and read this, well, look at the that in, in 14. Now Joram, with all Israel, had been the guard, been on guard to bring up Gilead against Haziel, king of Syria. And Haziel was the one, I believe, that was anointed to be the king of Syria. But Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds that the Syrians had given him. So if you go down through there and you read all, all of this, clear down through 37, we'll drop on down there. Well, verse 30, you look, this is 14 years later after uh, uh, Ahab is killed, all right? 14 years later, Jehu kills Joram, and he also kills Ahaziah, who is the king of Judah. And he doesn't stop there. He goes and he executes Jezebel. You remember the story? He comes into Jezreel, comes back there. She's up stairs looking out the window. She paints herself up. She's got to be old and kind of... <laughs> Do you go in peace? <laughs> no, there is no peace. Who's with her? Throw her down. Throw her down. And the people were, who were up there with her, her, they were smart enough to throw her down. And the dogs ate her, you know. But then uh, he, uh, in, in chapter 10, Jehu slaughters Ahab's descendants. He gets rid of all of the, all of the ones who would stand against him being king, and then he becomes the king. So just to refresh, oops. See, there's where we are. So you had Ahab reign for 22 years. And when he was killed, Ahaziah was two years. That was one of his sons. Then Joram for 12 years. So 14 years later, Jehu does all of this. And that's what that, the battle of uh, Jezreel is all about. What do they do? Look at this, worst of all. But the kingdom still stood. The northern kingdom still stood. Yeah. And then here's where I was saying, hey, does I, but no, it's Hoshea who becomes the last king. So here we are down in the time of Menahem when Hosea offers this prophecy. So it's going to be, uh, I, I'm thinking about 745, so 45, 24 years later, before the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. Okay? But that's what the reference there is to That's what the reference, that's why Jezreel, okay? Why do you call him Jezreel? Because in, in this picture, this analogy that's being given, the idolatry of the northern kingdom is going to end because the northern kingdom is going to end. And it should have, seen that idolatry should have ended. It should have ended when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal and Ashtra on Mount Carmel, but it didn't. Because evil kings continued on. And even with Jehu, Jehu, Jehu could have done a lot more, but he didn't. So it continues on. 
and God says, okay? Just like there was this slaughter that took place at Jezreel and the whole house of Ahab was destroyed, the house of the kings of the northern kingdom is going to be destroyed and the nation's going to be destroyed. God's going to scatter them. See how those kind of go together, the words, that's what really important. So Jehu assassinates Joram and Ahaziah, kills Jezebel, but he also takes out anybody who would have claim to the throne. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Verses 6 and 7 of Hosea chapter 1. Now, she conceived again and bore a daughter. she conceived and bore a son. Do you notice the difference between those two and uh, the end of verse 3? Compare those. It doesn't mention that she nursed him. No. Let, let me read it. Okay, verse 3, talking about Jezreel. And she conceived and bore him, that's Hosea, a son. Okay? Verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Verse 8. She conceived and bore a son. What's the difference in those three? Yeah. What happened? Yes, prostitute, ladies. Well, adultery, because they're not Hosea's daughter and son here. The last two? The last two. Jezreel is his son. But, okay, let's go back up to verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, which is Lo Ruhama. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, and I will save them by the Lord their God. The Lord their what? The Lord their God. The Lord is God. Father, Word, Holy Spirit, the Word becomes Jesus of Nazareth, who is our Lord. He is God. The Lord their God. Uh, but he's going to say, I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. So if you go back and you read the story here, after the northern kingdom is destroyed, Samaria is destroyed, the Assyrians attack Judah and Jerusalem, and they besiege Jerusalem in the time of Hezekiah. Right? 
and that's when Isaiah is prophesying. And what happens? What happens? Well, one night a plague strikes the army of the Assyrians who are besieging Jerusalem. I forget, what is it, 45,000 Assyrian soldiers die? And the king of Assyria, or maybe not the king, but the, the commander of the army, leaves, goes back to Assyria. And Jerusalem is saved, and Judah is saved. What? Not by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. The Lord, I, I will save them by the Lord their God. By miracle. Why? Because he has mercy on them. But on the northern kingdom, what? No mercy. Verse... Verses, seven, uh, verses 8 and 9. When she had weaned, no mercy. And what's that take? A couple of years? Back in those days, maybe? Typically, they didn't have bottles back in those days, right? So I think a couple of years. She conceived a poor son again. Poor son. And the, the Lord said, Call his name, not my people, which is Lo Ami in the Hebrew. Lo Ami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, what have they been saying all along? The Lord's not going to destroy us. Why? We're his people. He's our God. Even though on Monday we go over and worship this God, Tuesday we worship this God, Sunday we worship the Son, of course, the S-U and that. But now on the Saturday we might go down and worship. Worship the Lord. Like the law says, maybe. But you know, the Lord isn't going to destroy us. We're, we're His people. Not my people. You are not my people, and I am not your God. So you see what the Lord is doing? In this, He's presenting a picture. Okay? Hosea, how do you feel this happening to you? How does God? How does the Lord feel it happening to him with his people? So, verse 10 through chapter 2, verse 1. I don't know why chapter 2 starts here. Remember, men put these chapter headings in there. All right? Yet, verse, verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. He's going to destroy the northern kingdom, but what's going to happen? There's still going to be a bunch of Israelites, so to speak. Right? And who who can't number them? Here, here's the important thing. Who can't number them? Man can't number them. In... Uh, Revelation chapter 7, the second part of that, and I also saw a great multitude from every nation and tongue and blah, 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 whatever, a number that no man could number, but God can number them, see, but no man can. And, okay, how many, give me a number. How many people are there in the churches of Christ right now? Oh, no. no man can give you that number. Why not? Karen, here's my sermon. 
five weeks <laughs> to, to a degree, okay, just part of it. Here we are, we are this little group here of a great group, and the Lord's adding to the church out here daily. It changes so much, no one can keep up with how many, and how many names is he expunging? erasing from the book of life today. How many is he adding in? How many is he taking out? But he knows. The Lord knows. But that's... But again, here. The promise. There's, there's a promise there. Start with a remnant. Start with a few. How long does that take? What is it? 70, 75 people, 75 of the household of Jacob went down to Egypt and 400 years later, probably 6 million came out. Who did that? The Lord. The Lord did that. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea which cannot be measured or numbered and in the place where it was said to them you are not my people well where was the place where it was said you are not my people when they're talking about the Almani where they say it was born yeah but where was that said where was that prophecy made? Geographical location. The northern kingdom that God had actually given them, right? In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Here's the nation of it, the nation, the northern kingdom, Israel. You are not my people. Boom, they're going over here into exile. But that place, children of the living God. When's that going to happen? Got two choices. Got two choices. Choice number one exile. Choice number two, where was Jesus? Where did Jesus grow up? Nazareth, which is in the Northern Kingdom. Well, the area where the Northern Kingdom was. So, verse 11, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together Exile, that return from the exile, right? And they shall appoint for themselves one head, not a king, unless you would count the Hasmonean kings. Way down about, I'm not even sure right offhand, around 200 BC. Okay. And definitely you don't count Herod, because Herod was not in the house of David, he was in Gideon. Okay? They shall appoint for themselves one head, typically a governor at that point, all right, of the exile. And they shall go up from the land. They shall go up from the land I think that's talking about going into exile there. For great shall be the day of Jezreel. So there's hope there, right? There's hope 
they have to go into exile and there's going to be a day like that day of Jezreel when those the slaughter the slaughter go back and read about the slaughter that took place by Jehu and this is why I think verse 1 of chapter 2 really belongs with chapter 1 alright so you look at verse 8 shall call this people not my people for you are not my people and I am not your God but then after all this happens say to your brothers you are my people Who, who's going to say to your brothers you are my people and to your sisters you have received mercy now we switch back to the analogy the older brother right the older brother who's truly the son of Hosea who in essence is representing who well how about the southern kingdom that still receive is still is going to be saved Okay, they're going to go into exile too. But what happens when they come back from exile? What do the Judeans say to the people that had also come back who were from the northern kingdom? Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. Why? We're descendants of Abraham. We are the children of Israel. We're all in this together. But we're coming back as one nation. We're coming back with one head. We're not going to divide again. But so you have the exile, but then what else do you have? How about the church? How about the kingdom of Christ? Is that true for the kingdom of Christ? Now you have, you are my people. Do I have a reference here? The remnant shall be restored under the banner of Judah and the house of David. As in the days of Jehu and Jezreel, when the idolatrous leaders are destroyed and the people put away, and the people put away their idols and return to the Lord, it will be a great day of renewal. They're going to come back. As Jezreel was the true child of Hosea, so the true children of God in spirit and truth shall rejoice in the Lord. And again, I think you have a double fulfillment there coming back to Jerusalem and Judah, but not only that, the final fulfillment in the church when we come to the Lord. What do you think? Does that help set the tone? That, that, that's just chapter one. You've got chapter two and chapter three then uh, filling out this, this, uh, what, the, what did I even call it? Let's go back. The analogy of Hosea's family, okay? Because once we kind of grasp what's being talked about, then we get in chapter 4 on through is kind of like Amos. Same thing. Here's what Israel's done. Here's what I'm going to do. So we go that through that pretty quick. But there is a lot of stuff. And, and remember those points that we made. Uh, 
back here, looking for them, the lack of knowledge of God. Do you have a question or a comment? Have I gone too fast? Am I going too slow? Am I making sense? It's a lot to a shorter. It is. It is. So I'm trying to get it there fine-tuned in that. But it's hopefully it's adequate knowledge to get you to the point where it's not like, I don't understand this at all. Oh, I kind of get the drift. If you just get the drift of what's going on, it makes it a whole lot easier. And then, boy, when you put Jonah and Amos and Hosea and Micah, start putting them all together in those pieces like a puzzle coming together all of a sudden you get the whole picture there then when you get into Isaiah oh, I know what's going on do you know what the sphere of time is of the minor prophets where they Hundred years, fifty years, uh, or, or were they? You know, they're not chronological, more than likely. But just the span. But there's a there's a span of time here. That... Yeah. Okay. Does one disappear and another show up? Is that kind of I don't think so. I think Amos and Hosea and Micah are right about the same time. Jonah is, is maybe there, but the book of Jonah is a little bit before. So taking a little wider glance, okay, Jonah, if we say even 800 B.C., all right, Jonah's talking about Nineveh, Assyria, repent, and they do, they're not destroyed, they rise up to what their former status was, okay, and they're going to be used to punish the northern kingdom especially, right? So you have Jonah, and we'll just use 800, I think it was sooner, it, it may have been like seven I forget what I even said when we were looking at Jonah. But you take that time frame. But then you, you have uh, Amos and Hosea and Micah are called the pre-exilic. Pre-exilic, I don't want to even say pre-exilic, but they're pre-exilic for the northern kingdom, okay? Northern Kingdom is destroyed in 721 BC, and the Northern Kingdom, the remnant, is taken into exile. 721. Then you have other prophets in the middle, along with, say, Hosea. Now, you notice. southern kingdom and, and I 
Okay, the southern king, the northern kingdoms destroyed in 721 BC. Assyria is destroyed about six, 607, 606 BC. And at that time, uh, they come after Judah. The, the Babylonians come after Judah. All right? So you have 606, 696, or 596, 586 is when Jerusalem is destroyed. So you're going to have some prophets, minor prophets, in that time period talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Along with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah and Ezekiel also continue through that uh, initial exile. Jeremiah is taken to Egypt. Ezekiel is taken in exile over to the river Kibar in Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is taken to the capital. Okay. Those are the... So those... You have prophets, minor prophets there, and then when you get into actually the, the exile period, and you have uh, Haggai talks about the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, Malachi. Malachi is actually the last one. So, sec, uh, I forget what I said. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, I believe are the last three. But Malachi uh, is down pretty close to 400 BC. Close to it. So time span, you have nearly 400 years of minor prophets. As to periods of time, you have destruction of the northern kingdom, destruction of the southern kingdom, pre-exilic prophets, prophets while they're in exile, and prophets post-exilic of the minor prophets. You follow along with that? It is a long, long period of time. And, and that, that answers my question, I guess. It would, uh, I, it would have been better if I would have asked, you know, were they talking to the same audience, which they were. Mm -hmm. They were talking to four different, well, let me see, we're of we're what? Uh, lifespan of about a hundred. So sometimes forty to eighty years yeah. you would figure. So it's, it's but again, some of them were talking to the northern kingdom, right. some of them talking to the southern kingdom. Jonah talked to Assyria, Nineveh. Right? And uh Nahum I think actually talks, I don't know if he's talking to Nineveh, but he's talking about the destruction of Nineveh, uh, of Assyria, that happens later on. So, it's very, it's, it's long. Over this time span, just like throughout the, uh, later on in the Jewish they just can't get it right they just can't get it right with all of this divine intervention we can't get it right but and, and, and here's one important thing to to remember when they come back from exile they do not go back into idolatry They don't. And there are times, like in between the Testaments, when 
there are some groups that kind of want to uh, go adopt Western culture, like the Grecian culture, Hellenization they call it, where they want to go that way. That's what the Maccabees were, were fighting against. And you find that even at the time of, of Jesus, where the Sadducees are very much wanting to bring Roman culture in, you find a lot of fighting. It's not like we're just accepting of this. Uh, there, there were groups fighting against Roman occupation. Uh, Barabbas, uh, what, what was he and the, the two insurrectionists that were crucified with Jesus, what were they arrested for? Causing an insurrection and killing people. Well, what was their insurrection about? The Romans. Now, think we fail to to, sometimes fail to realize we're talking about, about a very small piece uh, geographically of the, the world at that time. There was a lot of stuff going on that we don't even know about, mm -hmm. like you just brought up, that brought influence historically, uh, even if it's not mentioned biblically, there's a lot of influence we don't know about. Well, that, that area was a crossroads of the world because three different continents. And if they were going to trade with one another, they had to come through that area. So you could imagine what influence Israel could have had on the rest of the world. But instead of being an influence for the Lord on the rest of the world, they allowed the world to influence them to be like the rest of the world. You know, God, from what you just said about the trade and all, they weren't put there by accident. They were put there because of those trade routes all went through that same area. And that's what made them rich. Taxed them. Tax those people coming through. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you for your time and attention.